Admiral Arun Prakash, Chairman of National Maritime Foundation and former Chief of Naval Staff, Dr. T. S. Sridhar, Principal Secretary and Commissioner of Archaeology Government of Tamil Nadu, Commodore S. Shekhar, Regional Director, National Maritime Foundation, Chennai Chapter, Group Captain L. V. Mohandas, Director, CII. We got worried with the pause that I have introduced. It is not by design. I happen to be a serving admiral in the Navy and have a flag lieutenant, which to the land lover is known by, by the nomenclature of ADC in the army. And normally flag lieutenants are under pressure on a day to day. The only time the admiral suffers his punishment in retaliation is when a script is made and printed by the flag lieutenant. And he's done it today. The first two sheets are blank. But God is on my side, flags. You will be shocked to learn that the first two sheets only had the history and maritime heritage, which has been ably covered by my predecessor. So I don't really have to worry. We, this country, as has just been mentioned by Admiral Arun Prakash, have only recently shed some of our sea blindness. But while the vision has come to six by nine, the color in this blindness is still missing. But we are slowly and surely awakening to the God sent opportunities that lie either untapped or underutilized in our maritime environment. For a country that has no alternative but to transact 95% of its trade by volume and between 75 and 80% by value, sometimes in, depending on the kind of exports or imports, it goes to almost 90% by value as well, which is likely to exceed about 600 billion US dollars this fiscal is close to touching the trillion dollar mark in global economic engagement, taking all components of economy that is traded in and outside the country. Sitting on euphoria of impressive growth is not going to sustain economic progress forever. Many people misconstrue the meaning of maritime power, believing it to be sea power, believing it to be naval combat power alone. But there are a score of components only one of which is the naval force of a state. All the others directly contribute to the growth of a nation and decide the rate of progress of national income, be it ports, building yards, fisheries, offshore activities like mining, fishing, energy conduits, tourism, of which there is no lack of potential in this country along the coast, strategic industry, Transaction of raw materials and products in the core sector, including power, cement, refineries, fertilizers, and the like, all of which are heavily dependent on access to the seas. Sardar K. M. Panikar, the doyen of Indian maritime strategic thought, wrote many epistles on the subject and preached the importance of the sea with lessons from our maritime past, which, as you've just been told, is rich than the richest in the world. He even gave refresher capsules to the political hierarchy at that time on maritime thought and its value to the Indian nation. But even in modern times, we have continued to discount the value of our geographical location, straddling the major trade routes of the Indian Ocean and the vast seas of opportunities. Opportunities of wealth that lie in abundance on both the western and the eastern shores of our country but remain dormant like non-performing assets in our banks. We are not even 25% in satisfaction rate in terms of exploitation of and use of what is called access to the seas. With a coastline of 7,500 plus kilometers, an open water body of mammoth proportions, unhindered by any other land masses, except for a few in our neighborhood, 12 major and 200 other ports and a large number of deltas and spits. Is there any need for our country to look for locations for harbors and shipyards and other activities in the maritime domain? 
very few maritime countries can lay claim to such vast riches of maritime wealth, but much fewer to the neglect, as in our case, of development of infrastructure in the maritime sector. Since times immemorial, the world has watched that maximum development takes place within 50 to a maximum of 150 kilometers away from the seashore. Most industries reside in this bit. And today, ladies and gentlemen, it is a known fact that 50% of the world's population lives within 16 land miles close to 25 to 27 kilometers of the shore. Why? Because all the development is focused on the coastline. That is where the access to the seas permits you interdependence without which you cannot survive, without which your economic machine cannot move ahead. Just rewind to prove this point. Those analyses a decade ago and closer on disparity between China's east coast and the hinterland to the west in that country. Do you really have to do in-depth surveys to determine reasons why this disparity exists and is only becoming larger and larger? Primarily because the sea offers opportunities in abundance and you just have to tap them and go beyond subsistence farming as our fishermen do. And so far as our geography goes, ask any of the 44 landlocked countries on this planet and they'll give their left arm for such a handsome peninsula with immeasurable opportunities for ports, shipyards, fish, oil, gas, mineral exploitation and so on. And what are the two most prominent spin-offs if, if we were to develop maritime India the way the world would develop a peninsula like this? Firstly, the enormous opportunity for multi-stream employment across all ages and skills. Secondly, Efficiency of physical transaction of commerce at seaports, shipyards, fishing harbors, and exploitation of businesses for the core sector will attract greater investment and downstream development from India and abroad. Both spin-offs will serve to enlarge the pace as well as the volume of this country's economy. And will actually realize that dream that we keep hearing on the TV and the press these days from economists called inclusive growth. That is when the downstream eff eff effect of such development will actually be truly visible and truly in place. History has shown that no nation that aspires to greatness can ne neglect the maritime dimension, except of course, as I pointed out, the 44 landlocked countries. The ancient Indian doctrine of Jalayam Jasya, Valayam Tasya, he who rules the seas is all powerful, holds good forever. Let us do a brief reality check on where do we stand this for in this urge for greatness in just a few maritime fields. Of the 8.2 billion tons of seaborne goods traded in 2009 over the seas, our share as we call throughput at the 12, or some people call it 13, major and 200 other ports was 850 million tons. Sounds impressive because it's gone to millions beyond tons. But just compare, as, is, as has become fashionable to compare almost for any country and particularly for us with the Chinese economy. And compare all this with Shanghai. In the year 2007, Shanghai port alone created a record of crossing 700 million tons. In that year, our largest port, Kandla, notched 70 million tons. And the whole of 12 major and 200 minor and intermediate ports in this country notched 710 million tons. Now, it's very easy for anyone to say that the Chinese Economy is based on the manufacturing sector and ours the consumption driven economy. Then why do you have ships waiting in the roads for four days and big ticket vessels and large super Panamax vessels and container carriers refuse to touch our ports? Why is it that we are fed by feeder vessels only? Only because. So strictly speaking, if you create avenues and create the capacity, automatically waiting times will reduce you will generate much more and much larger percentage in your economy. 
let's look at shipbuilding. Globally, shipbuilding is a $20 billion industry, recording a 29% CAGR over the first half of the past decade, short of the recession years. Though the growth trajectory had cooled off during the recession, reaching an F of 7%, the projected rate is expected to be 14 to 15% globally. And most of it, as you know, is going to be in Asia. Shipyards offer a wide range of technologies, employ a significantly huge number of workers, directly and indirectly, and gen generate foreign exchange reserves that cannot be matched by any other sector. High labor costs in Western shipyards have led to a gradual shift to the center of shipbuilding to Asian nations over the last two decades. Japan used shipbuilding in the 50s and 60s to rebuild its industrial structure after the war. Korea made shipbuilding a strategic industry in the 70s. And now, China last year superseded both these countries in terms of build capacity, period of build, number of building docks and slipways. And due to very low costs, obviously, for its manpower, the largest order book currently in excess of 40 million tons in terms of gross tonnage has gone to China. That, ladies and gentlemen, accounts for 20% of the world market. We are nowhere. That doesn't mean we have to compare ourselves for almost every part of statistics and start saying we should reach the same place. But the dynamics of our environment and the beautiful peninsula that we have inherited from times immemorial dictate that we focus our energies and our thoughts towards development, particularly of indigenous shipbuilding. Indian shipbuilding has always been dogged by low capacity, poor productivity, and lack of technology infusion. Though the industry's order books have grown from some 816 crores in 2002 to more than 25,000 crores, these figures actually tend to deceive us. They pertain more to warships, OSVs and smaller vessels, ferries and tugs, in which we become masters, because most of our shipyards are very small. We claim to have some 27 or 28 shipyards, but actually we have only five major shipyards. And none of them are into the business of making large vessels, certainly not for Indian shipyards, and nobody from abroad is going to invest, unless we start doing what two shipyards in the private sector have started showing in the last couple of years. Our global share is minuscule. The government has set a target of 8%, which is um, ambitious, 8% by 2017, but can be achieved if the correct strategy is adopted even now. A point of interest is that while China may be well ahead of India in total shipbuilding, its productivity is almost the same as India insofar as its manpower is concerned, with China having a figure of 50 deadweight tons. 56 deadweight tons in comparison to India, which has 50 deadweight tons per person. Incidentally, the figures for Korea and Japan are close to 300, and that's why they are where they were. We also need to leverage our labor costs. In India, the labor cost per worker per year is about 1,000 plus US dollars, which is very low compared to anywhere in the West, and even in Korea, in the Republic of Korea, which is 10,000, and in Singapore, it's about 20,000 dollars per annum. If nothing else, make the world's OSVs and tugs. Yet the private sector is showing, as I said, promise, but the numbers are too few and we need to encourage by throwing in tax holidays, etc. And the 12 major ports in our country handle 75% of the traffic. A total of 850 million, as I mentioned, was the throughput last year. And the government has put a, a figure of 2.5 billion tons to be achieved by 2020, which still pales in comparison to China's present 7.5 billion tons achieved last year. And China is growing at 14%, even if we were to grow at just about 7 to 8%. I think we need much more capacity. The problem here is compounded by the fact that we are already utilizing 93% on an average of our available berthing in ports, with ships having to wait for berths in the roads from four to ten days, depending on the kind of harbor. It should be the other way down. Births should be waiting for ships. So the global average is about 70 to 75 percent. And that is that means that you need to not only add more births, you need to deepen your channels, and most importantly, 
modernize logistics evacuation and infrastructure and that means communication within and to the main railheads and to the main highways coastal cargo traffic still goes at a rate of about 8 and a half percent these are the coastal shipping capacity which is going to a half percent Telling us where our efforts should be addressed and where our focus must lie. Look at Indian waterways. Where we have rivers, we have tributaries and canals with an available length of 64,000 kilometers in this country, offer a huge potential. But since the formation of the Indian Water Authority of India, we have created only 4,000 kilometers of navigable water. One cannot really blame that agency because the promotion, encouragement, and awareness of this particular medium of transportation is just not rising. The potential in our country is set to 12 to 16,000 kilometers of water. Even if these waters are shallow, it doesn't really matter. Because the world over, including in America and in China, the maximum draft that is permissible by those rivers is 3 to 4 meters. In our case, it is a maximum of 2 meters. It doesn't really matter. Barges with shallow draft but with large volume capacity can do the trick. When we talk of fishing, the picture is even more distant. Though we boast of a coastline of 7,516 kilometers, we are handicapped by a largely unorganized sector which has just been spoken about. It is said more fish die of old age than, being, than by being harvested in our exclusive economic zone. And look at some other countries like Peru, which generated two and a half billion dollars of foreign exchange by exporting 2.25 million tons of fish in the year of the recession 2008. Our total cash has been at six to six and a half million tons and the potential is about 40 million tons. What is the reason? We boast of 200,000 craft, traditional, motorized, mostly traditional. Amongst the motorized there are just about 26,000 craft. But worse than all this is the great potential that lies in the deep waters of the East Coast, particularly in the Bay of Bilbao, lesser on the West Coast, which require deep sea mechanized and modernized fishing trawlers. We have just 172 of them. How can we ever go and tap that fish which is dying with your gold age? Actually, countries are waiting to receive those imports, and they've been waiting, and hopefully, some awareness over here will turn into execution. Hydrocarbons and minerals, there is no dearth of them. The untapped potential of gas hydrate, gas and some more oil in our exclusive economic zone lies in wait to be tapped. Polymetallic nodules in the ocean floor are considered to be a treasure trove of much needed metals. Surveys have confirmed that about 15 million square kilometers of the Indian Ocean, a large amount of that within our EZ could easily meet the needs, at least of India and a part of the world. The technology to grab minerals at affordable costs is what needs attention of seminars like these. That we have a deficit of thinking, ladies and gentlemen, and a greater deficit of implementing at speed that is desired is not in doubt. And nowhere is it more pronounced than in the maritime community. For how long will we keep lamenting of having missed the industrial revolution or not receiving efficient support from the administration? The right approach to shake the slumber in a democracy like ours is brainstorming through fora like these and push awareness, yes, push that awareness where there is slumber. The presence in this forum today of such a varied cross section of delegates exhibits the enormous interest this seminar of interest. In addition to the formal schedule of professional papers, notes exchanged during the sidelines of the seminar which go a long way in bringing new ideas and in addressing bilateral issues as well. I sincerely hope that participants can find many a common thread to weave and that this seminar will give the right impetus to harness the core competencies and capabilities of all stakeholders in the maritime domain of our country. So that the roadmap for sharpening India's maritime vision to a six by six is finally achieved. Thank you.